Welcome to the Compounding Center Connections, where we talk about different health conditions with our partner practitioners. I'm your host, Jay Gill, a compounding pharmacist from the Compounding Center in Leesburg, Virginia. At the Compounding Center, we collaborate with practitioners, create custom medications to help our patients get better. So our guest today is Dr. Alexander Kofinas, the founder and director of Kofinas Perinatal in New York. He's also a prolific researcher, clinical associate professor at Cornell University's College of Medicine, and author of the book, The Working Womb. Welcome, Dr. Kofinas. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Jay. Uh, it's nice to be with you. Could you please uh, introduce yourself, your practice uh, to the listeners and viewers? Yes, uh, I'm a medical doctor. I uh, specialized in uh, first general OBGYN. Then I did a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine, which is the practice of dealing with high-risk pregnancies, meaning pregnancies with complications such as preeclampsia, diabetes, hypertension, uh, growth failure, premature rupture of membranes, etc. Uh, one of the patients of those groups is also infertility patients. So although by training I am an MFM, maternal fetal medicine specialist, 100% of the patients I see nowadays are coming to me and they're not pregnant. Mm. Uh, they are patients who have experienced infertility they have visited a fertility clinic. They had multiple IVF procedures and they have failed to conceive and they were labeled slash diagnosed as unexplained infertility. So that's the bulk of my patients, 99.9%. Okay. Uh, so it's difficult for me to define myself. <laughs> I see myself more as a placenta specialist. And because taking care of the placenta, it requires you to be treating patients before those infertility patients are for me the best medium to help develop healthy and fully developed babies. Gotcha. So uh, in this episode, we're gonna discuss the use of low-dose naltrexone or LDN in infertility, specifically infertility related to endometriosis and other auto autoimmune conditions. So before we get started, uh, a basic disclaimer, the information discussed today is for information purposes only, not for diagnosis or treatment. So let's get started. So Dr. Kofinas, uh, on your website, you talk about healthy pregnancies are possible, okay? So could you give us some insight? What do you mean by that, uh, you know, uh, that healthy pregnancies are possible? Well, um Basically, if women are managed the way that we manage them today, globally, kind of, I mean, the US and the and Europe and Canada, mm -hmm. and many other even um, developing countries, they pretty much practice the same kind of obstetrics and gynecology. 70% of the pregnancies go on uh, on an automatic pilot and they have a healthy outcome within certain parameters. The 30%, however, develops some kind of a complication that could be premature labor, could be miscarriage before 22 weeks, could be a uh, preterm delivery, could be preeclampsia, hypertension, diabetes, and so forth. This, this is the group of people that I was trained to take care of. Now, what I have come to realize, and I'm sure a lot of other people have done so, is that the placenta was the most neglected organ in human existence. And, and thankfully, in 2015, when the NIH convened a uh, global congress to discuss about the importance of placenta, they called the placenta the Rodney danger field of human organs. You know, the comedian who used to say, I get no respect. Yeah. It's probably the most neglected I mean, organ in human existence. And the goal of that human placenta project was to educate obstetricians, gynecologists, and other specialists about the value. The sad part is that this, con this conference was convened not by obstetricians, and that's sad, but by people of other specialties. 
hmm. uh, cardiology specifically, because the placenta is the unique uh, plug between the baby and the mother. So the baby gets everything through the placenta from the mother. And we thought for decades uh, that the placenta is simply a pass-through system that may control some things, may protect the baby from some bad things and allow the good things. Well, that was very half or less true. The placenta is an active organ that really defines the baby's existence and defines the baby's health into eternity until the baby's death, okay? Uh, in fact, a study, the first study that uh, showed the significance of the placenta was an epidemiological study in, London, in England, in Wales specifically, where they looked at placenta weight or fetal weight, which correlate if the placenta is small, the baby is going to be small. So fetal weight at birth, it was a single most important correlate for cardiovascular death. Mm. More important than smoking as an individual factor, diabetes as an individual factor, and hypertension. Why? Because the placenta causes, if it suffers, it causes epigenetic changes on the baby to help it survive the deprivation that the environment has so the baby cannot get to fully develop it survives in utero but then it pays a price later on because these epigenetic changes accelerate the aging process for the baby accelerate the vascular process aging of the baby accelerate cardiovascular disease diabetes hypertension which all individually are less important correlates than the placenta weight or the baby's weight alone it's a very powerful thing if you want to have healthy people you've got to have healthy placentas that's the bottom line so yeah, that's let's, uh, so oh, let's uh let's uh you know dive into that you talk a lot about uh placenta health and a healthy placenta um you know so could you talk a little bit more about what do you recommend or you know when a patient um partners with you in their journey to have a healthy pregnancy like you know what do you offer um, as this, you know, healthy placenta that you're talking about. Could you talk a little bit more in depth about that? Yes. Uh, the placenta, Jay, is basically a vast network of blood vessels. These are fetal blood vessels that uh, come into, imagine a bowl uh, full of blood and take a plant, uproot it, wash out the dirt from the roots, and then stick the roots inside the bowl with blood. So the root is the baby's blood vessels bathed into the maternal blood. This is a hemochorial type of placenta, the human placenta. And that placenta is very vulnerable to inflammation or clotting directly. So clotting coagulation problems or inflammation problems can lead to vascular thrombosis. The baby's blood vessels clot. Maternal blood vessels also can clot. Both can clot, so it depends which system suffers or both, the severity of placenta failure goes up. So the placenta function drops, the placenta capacity and sufficiency to grow the baby to its expectations according to the baby's genetic code diminishes. And the more the diminution, the higher the rate of subsequent life events to the adult who is going to be of that baby. So what are the things? I mean, one of the major problems with my colleagues is that they don't think that they can affect the placenta. There's nothing you can do about it. They see a blood clot and say, well, all placentas have a blood clot. No, that's not true. When there's a blood clot in the uterus, 75% of the pregnancies end up with some kind of complication or loss. So mm -hmm. don't tell me all pregnancies. Yes, many pregnancies have it, but if you do nothing, you're going to end up with complications. So Inflammation, autoimmune conditions of any kind can cause a problem, right? Coagulopathy is based on genetic mutations of certain coagulation genes. The mother and the father, we test them. So before we go into the next pregnancy on these patients who were called unexplained, we yeah. investigate the immune system for autoimmune conditions. We look at the immune system in terms of the activity, cytotoxicity, and numbers of the natural killer cells, which are instrumental in a healthy pregnancy. You need natural killer cells to facilitate the baby's attachment and invasion of the mother. But too many of them, and too cytotoxic, they kill the trophoblast, and either they cause a smaller placenta or they fail the pregnancy altogether. 
So this is the kind of workup we do along also with the basic metabolic assessment of the mother. A lot of women nowadays are overweight. They have insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is toxic. It causes implantation failure. So inflammation is at the core. The methylation process system is at the core. And all of these things influence placenta development. So um, problems such as uh, endometriosis, fibroids, uh, yes. PCOS, um, could you uh, talk a little about how they cause infertility, which is related to a little bit what you're talking about, inflammation and autoimmune stuff. Could you talk a little bit more about that? To least understand. To go back to the library, I mean, you know, I did not discover these things. Yes, I have discovered a lot of things. I published about them, but, you know, I'm a clinician working 12 hour days. So uh, there's so many bright scientists out there who do amazing work. And much of this work is not even published in obstetrical journals. Mm. Because issues, autoimmunity is everywhere today. We're talking about numbers beyond 25% of the population. It used to be 2% 20 years ago. Now, endometriosis is treated as if, if you have pain, my lady, okay, I'm going to look for endometriosis. If you don't have pain, no, you don't have. Only 40% of women with endometriosis experience pain of any kind. When you have a woman having infertility, you should never move on unless you rule out endometriosis. They don't. They fail an embryo, the risk becomes 50%. A second embryo, 80%. So endometriosis is not the lesions in the uterus. The lesions are the consequence of the underlying autoimmune, chronic, systemic, onto, uh, autoimmune, inflammatory condition. So endometriosis is a chronic, systemic, affects the whole body. Inflammatory disease and the lesions are a consequence of that because the immune system in the peritoneal cavity, can specifically the cytokine, mixture of cytokines allows the endometrial cells that drop during the menstruation to thrive and grow. Now, all women have backflow into the peritoneal cavity. Only 10 to 15% develop endometriosis. Why? Because these women have a disturbed immune system. Now, likewise, adenomyosis, which has been ignored for a lot, unless it was massive. And adenomyosis is not a new condition. And it generates a lot of inflammation and poisons the endometrial environment, likewise the endometriosis. Myomas, well, myomas have been blamed for so many pregnancy losses, but God, please, 50% of women, and even more so at the age of 40, have fibroids, right? Lyomyomas. Now, when an obstetrician finds a lyomyoma, aha, I found the culprit. That's where you lost your baby. No, this is the biggest BS. Okay, lymiomas physically, for what they think they are, they don't have an effect. Location-wise, a submucosal myoma might cause a problem on the implantation process because of disturbance in the blood flow of the endometrium. The spiral arterioles are compressed. They don't really yield to be invaded by the placenta trophoblast. But now we know that fibromyomas uh, cause inflammatory, they are inflammatory producers. So they do more harm on the implantation stage and first pregnancy loss because of the inflammation. And mm. if the patient has autoimmune underlying conditions, it's even more. Wow. Well, so that's so how they cause fertility. And the metriosis, of course, is known for causing disturbance of the fallopian tubes, right? And obstruction yeah. of fallopian tubes. Most obstetricians, if you ask them, how does endometriosis cause infertility, they will say that. But then endometriosis causes massive oxidative stress of the ovaries. It disturbs the milieu of the granulosa cells and they lose the ability, the granulosa cells of the phallic lose the ability to recruit the phallic for the next ovulation. So you have ovulation disturbances, but even the eggs that you ovulate have massive um, uh, mitophagy where the mitochondria have been destroyed because of the oxidative stress caused by the endometriosis. Wow. Okay. Well, uh, can we now move into what are your some treatment uh, options that you use? Or you know, in your what treatment options do you have uh, for these conditions um, in your practice? What do you commonly use to help well, these patients? For yeah, for endometriosis, for example, 
uh, you have to clean out the lesions because the lesions become a secondary source of profound inflammation. So you have to take them out. Okay. The lesions will come back in about 12 months. So oh. there is a you know, tremendous need for us to find ways to slow down this progress, to extend the window in which the patient could conceive on her own, because most of these patients can conceive on their own as long as they have a good semen and they have ovulation, ovulatory function and eggs, right? Now, if you need to do an IVF, fine, do the IVF in between. But there's tremendous need to find ways to slow it down and possibly permanently or to extend it so far that if I can slow down the recurrence of the endometriosis, the physical lesions of the endometriosis by five years, that's going to be a great thing. Yeah. So, uh, and here, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it on naltrexone. So another thing that uh, endometriosis causes, that causes infertility, uh, is uh, the actual effect on the endometrial immune profile, something that we can test. We can do a biopsy and analyze it. A hyperactive endometrial immune profile or hypoactive uh, is not good for implantation. It can fail. And endometriosis can be seen on both ways because we don't understand exactly the exact interactions between the NK cell activity and inflammatory cytokines in the endometrium versus the uterine cavity. There's a lot yet to be analyzed and be studied. But in my practice, Mm -hmm. What I do that helps me succeed in patients who failed repeatedly because of uh, untreated endometriosis is not only the treatment that I insist for them to have laparoscopy before they waste another embryo, but I start them on anti-inflammatory. Uh, until recently, the only thing I had was basically supplements, uh, anti-inflammatory supplements, supplements such as glucosamine, for example, or a lipoic acid which exert, uh, or curcumin, which exert an inhibitory effect on the nuclear factor kappa beta, which is a transcription factor that translocates from the cytoplasm into the nucleus and stimulates production. It activates, it transcribes the gene that produces tumor necrosis factor alpha and other inflammatory cytokines. So these natural supplements are very useful in cooling down the inflammation. And the great thing about them they cool it down to the normal level. They never oversuppress. If I put them on prednisone, I run the risk of oversuppressing and bringing the opposite effect again. Yeah. So fast forward, I mean, last not fast forward, but a few months ago, actually, uh, not, maybe one and a half year ago, I came across some data about LDN, low-dose naltrexone. And this is a fascinating medication. It's a medication, it's a supplement. Uh, it's a prescription medication. As we all know, most people know that it is an antidote. It's a, a receptor antagonist to opioid receptors. And it's used primarily, it's been FDA approved for uh, people who are addicted to opioids to use on their uh, recovery, you know, to, to uh, get uh, rid of the addiction uh, as well as alcohol addiction. That's yes. one of the medical indications. But over time, uh, we realized that uh, it has powerful anti-inflammatory effects. So some original case reports and discussions and some anecdotal cases, uh, uh, you know, presented data that patients with endometriosis that failed IVF, they succeeded with LDN treatment. Okay. Now, there's a lot of physicians who would say, oh, you know, uh, there's not really evidence because there's no clinical randomized trial. And yeah. I can tell you right now, uh, I, you know, I won't be around uh, when such data ever would come, uh, but I can guarantee you they will never come. Nobody's going to do a randomized clinical trial that will cost 50 million or 100 million to test naltrexone, a out-of-patent medication. So don't anybody hope and wait when I know a drug's side effects and I know the potential benefits yeah, and the benefits, the potential benefits, even if they don't happen, they are more than the risks that I'm putting the patient on. I use that medication of label. And I so started based on my philosophy on that. I started using low dose naltrexone. And I can tell you that, you know, almost every patient that we used it on, Came back. That's 
Amazing. And would you uh, would you guesstimate how many patients you're talking about? Uh, the number? I'm sorry, Dr. Kofinas, uh, the recording froze a little bit. Could you just repeat that again? Yes, uh, I see about 350 such infertility patients annually. They're very complicated patients. I'm the only person who does that. And so it, it's uh, really uh, beyond my capacity to expand the numbers. But yeah. uh, a big number of these patients, I would say almost 80%, have endometriosis. And every single patient of them since uh, the beginning of 2023, after I did some careful utilization of naltrexone in some select patients, uh, they are starting on naltrexone. And in fact, I use the naltrexone before they go for the laparoscopy. Uh, when I have a patient who has not been diagnosed with endometriosis, but I suspect with a certainty of 90 plus percent based on the history of IVF failures, and a positive BCL6 on the endometrial biopsy. BCL6 is an inflammatory marker. When it's positive in a natural cycle, it means 94% of these patients have endometriosis. Hmm. And I, I believe that all of these patients have endometriosis. The ones that don't have endometriosis are basically either somebody who looked at them, failed to see the endometriosis. If it is not the classic endometrial tissue, but sometimes looks like a yellow uh, deposit uh, of old endometriosis. Uh, and even if they have no lesions at all, the underlying condition, remember, is the autoimmune condition. And BCL6 is an expression of this inflammatory autoimmune condition. The lesions will come. Even if they're not here today, the yeah. effect on the pathology of the pregnancy and the success of the pregnancy is there. Therefore, I start all patients in attraction. When they come back to me, and they have endometriosis, which, you know, 95% of them almost have it, I'm okay because I started my game, my treatment before. And then I continue it. And then I okay. plan the next pregnancy, the next IVF or spontaneous conception. If I feel that they don't need an IVF and they can ovulate properly and have a good quality egg, which we achieve by providing uh, ovarian rejuvenation supplementation, then uh, they succeed on their own. And they, you know, they have frozen embryos that, uh, yeah, you know, I don't know what they're going to do, but they may never need them. So, uh, does a patient continue during the pregnancy till birth? Yeah. Or... We, okay. We con yeah, we continue naltrexone uh, until some point, and I'll explain here. There's no data. We know that in pregnancy, on addicted women, as much as 50 milligrams of naltrexone uh, has been used throughout pregnancy, and uh, no side effects have been identified in the mother or the baby. Okay. Now, I'm always very skeptical on things that can have a central nervous system effect about uh, the studies that show uh, there's no effect because primarily they look at congenital defects. Gotcha. Now, like SSRIs, for example, they say, well, some SSRIs, Paxil specifically has been linked to pulmonary stenosis of the baby's heart. So all SSRIs, people have to be careful. I don't give a damn about the pulmonary stenosis. I can diagnose it and uh, it's treatable. I care about the effect on the serotonin production of the baby and the reuptake. Uh, the baby's brain does not produce serotonin. And it is a placenta that produces serotonin in the first 24 weeks. And the basic infrastructure of the brain is dominated by serotonin actions. The serotonin is the architect of the brain. And if the placenta, we don't know, nobody has studied the effect of serotonin production by the placenta, which is the only source. Serotonin does not cross the placenta. Serotonin is produced actively by the placenta and is passed into the baby. After 24 weeks, the brain expansion and the cortex development is based on the serotonin production from the fetal brain. Well, what is the effect of Paxil or Zoloft on a baby's brain we know they cause a placenta in terms of developing this infrastructure of the brain that everything would be based on after the baby is born. That yeah. has never been studied. And it's very difficult to be studied. Yeah. Okay. So I'm very skeptical about using things. So when I need what I need naltrexone for is the initial inflammatory environment to be, you know, kind of cool down a little bit so the baby can succeed. Once I see the baby on the first visit, I see my patients at five and a half weeks, five weeks and two days. It is the first 
assessment of the placenta. Baby doesn't exist yet. It is there. It's not visible by ultrasound. We only see the yolk sac, gestational sac and yolk sac. And I look at the trophoblast and the blood flow development with power Doppler, color power Doppler. Okay, we measure the uterine artery blood flow. So we get an idea. We see the trophoblast. Is it intact? Is it invading properly? The depth of invasion. Is the trophoblast inflamed? I can see inflammation. Is the trophoblast broken down because of thrombotic lesions and necrosis? So based on the placenta quality, I stopped naltrexone at this point in my life at eight to nine weeks. The baby's brain is barely there. So if we have any effect, it will be minuscule because most of the baby's brain development happens beyond 24, but the infrastructure happens between five, six weeks and 24 weeks. Mm -hmm. And then the baby's own serotonin takes over beyond that point. So I'm, I'm, you know, I don't need it. If I don't need it, I'm not going to use it. And by taking the the uh, the uh, naltrexone, stopping at eight weeks to nine weeks, I'm fine. And then I started again after they stop breastfeeding, if they have endometriosis. So we keep going to suppress endometriosis and move on to the next pregnancy. Gotcha. Okay. Now going back to some supplements you had talked about, and I just want to make sure I have uh, the list. You said you use curcumin and something else. Uh, before conception, I use lipoic acid. Lipoic acid, okay. Curcumin. Okay. And all of this stuff depends on uh, the, you know, we assess inflammatory cytokine ratios in the patient and the NK cell activity. Uh, I use uh, glucosamine which is a very powerful, in fact, is uh, on par with the uh, non-NSAID, you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories in terms of yeah. inhibition of the, uh, of the uh, 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 nuclear factor kappa beta. Now, of course, Motrin and stuff, they inhibit also CAX2. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, CAX, uh, the uh, 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 cyclooxygenase uh, enzyme, uh, something that luteolin, another anti-inflammatory supplement, does. Uh, I use uh, uh, methylation support because 98% of my pa of these patients have mutations of the MTHFR gene that makes them unable to methylate properly. Uh, diminished methylation produces diminished amounts of all neurotransmitters. Uh, it, it leads to diminished uh, development of the neurological tissues. It leads to neurodegenerative conditions. Uh, and if you combine this with autoimmunity, it, it's hell. And that's why we see, you know, autism going through the roof the last few years. It's a very complex issue that it's for another time. Yeah. So I use those. I use uh, magnesium uh, both before and after in pregnancy, and specifically magnesium l threonate which causes a placenta uh, and the baby's brain, by the way, uh, along with uh, magnesium malate chelate and glycinate chelate. Those have a powerful anti-inflammatory effect on the placenta. And placenta inflammation causes premature labor, causes fetal brain damage, causes, causes neurodevelopmental delays, causes schizophrenia, causes autism. Wow. So it's extremely important. I use melatonin. Well, a lot of women have sleeping issues, but I don't treat them for the sleep. I use melatonin for the placenta, for the ovaries before conception, for endometriosis before conception to suppress the inflammatory disturbances that lead to growth of endometrial tissue outside the uterus. And also in pregnancy, melatonin uh, is a very powerful protector of brain damage during the reperfusion injury process. In other words, if the baby compresses the cord and gets asphyxia for a few seconds, it doesn't die. Well, when the oxygen comes back, the baby's brain cells have been depleted of antioxidants and this massive influx of oxygen increases substantially the oxidation process because the cells are hungry to produce energy and there's not enough antioxidation, so they sustain substantial oxidative damage. And this is what causes the brain damage of the baby and cerebral palsy. Uh, so they use melatonin in NICUs when a baby goes through an asphyxia episode. Mm -hmm. And if you start early enough, 
uh, you help it. So we don't have studies specifically uh, for melatonin in humans, and we will never have such studies. But again, the safety profile is such that I don't care. We use it safely. Yeah. Likewise, creatine. Creatine, we have animal studies, experimental studies, that if you clip the cord of one animal to asphyxia just before death and to another baby, another animal, and one animal gets infused with creatine, the animal with creatine will not develop any brain damage. And yes, I have used creatine in one of my patients who had a cord compression issue. She was 32 weeks. The baby was pushing on the cord because breached the cord dropped below the baby's feet. And we're trying to extend the pregnancy. We made it to 33 weeks, basically. And the baby came out amazingly good and went home in three weeks, which is phenomenal. A 32-week baby to go home only after three weeks in the NICU. So wow. this is part of the whole packet. But every patient gets a highly specialized protocol because patients might have insulin resistance along that. So I rebalance inflammation with insulin resistance because they interact with each other. Well, Dr. Kofinas, um, you shared a wealth of information with us today. Thank you for joining us today. Um, how would someone uh, reach out to you after listening to this recording? Um, well, basically, I have two websites, uh, Jay. One is cofinasperinatal.org, or G. That's my old uh, website, which is a wealth of information that I have published a lot of my own. Um, I mean, pieces written specifically for patients, not my scientific. They can find my scientific papers online, on Medline, but... Uh, that website has amazing information and they can search for everything. I, I used to publish a newsletter, which uh, everything is still so valid because it is so advanced and nothing has changed since when I wrote these things. Likewise, my book was written in 2012. I finished it and was not published until uh, last year because of technical issues with the publishers and all these things. But it has been still as up to the moment and it will be for the next 10 years, the way I see uh, my my specialty moving, they don't get what is going on. They still mm -hmm. practice obstetrics based on 60 years ago. Now, and I have another website, which I try to help patients to intercept them before they go to a fertility clinic, because more any, if not most of these patients do not need infertility clinics because they don't have infertility. They have some issues that prevent them from conceiving but these issues are easily identifiable and fixable. This website is Dr. Kofinas, drkofinas.com. Okay. Uh, and I, I explain things about the placenta protocol and some other issues. Well, so, I'll, I'll make sure to put this contact uh, information uh, on your both the websites uh, and where to purchase your book on the show notes. Um, that would be great, and, yes. So uh, in closing... By the way, Jay, this book is, every penny of the book is donated to a uh, fund that I helped be created at Wake Forest. And this fund uh, money will be used to uh, to fund uh, placenta education and placenta research. Oh, that's amazing. Well, yeah. it's, a, it's uh, a holy, you know, holy mission for me to do well. Um, so, uh, so thank you everyone for tuning into the Compounding Center Connections podcast. We hope you found this information presented today to be helpful. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to me at j at compoundingcenter.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and our podcast channel, The Compounding Center Connections, and stay tuned for future episodes. Thank you, Dr. Kofinas. Thank you, Jay, for having me on. It was great. Thank you. Thank you.